All right, well, good morning. Uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, it's a little bit different up here today. We don't have the, our little stand, our pulpit with Daniel speaking. We have a, we have a group of individuals, um, members of our missions team, who at about uh, 12 hours from now will have been back from Atlanta for two weeks. And we are going to, the, the, the purpose of today is to share a little bit about what we experienced down there. Um, you know, both uh, in the physical and in the spiritual, what God revealed to us, um, the knowledge and wisdom that we feel that God has given us to, to bring back to the church, to bring back to this community, to affect change in the church and in the community. Um, so you'll hear from each one of us today. I'll just tell you a little bit, a, a quick overview of, of kind of how it worked, if you're unfamiliar with how the mission strip worked, but uh, this journey started about, what, nine months ago-ish for us, and uh, we set this up. We left July 25th, early in the morning. We drove down to Atlanta. We got there. Uh, we stayed in a, in a church that partners with the Atlanta Dream Center. It was actually a renovated parking garage. Uh, a storied parking garage that we stayed in. Uh, pretty nice accommodations, I think. And uh, we reported that next morning, and, and we had breakfast. Every day started at about 7.30. We would have breakfast, followed by worship, they prayer and worship. That was a huge part of our day, right? We had to fill up our own cups in order to, uh, to pour out. And then we had a morning event, which was kind of flexible, kind of, kind of fluctuated. We had lunch. We had an afternoon event, which was generally with kids. Uh, one day it was actually in a very diverse community, uh, predominantly Muslim. So that was interesting to interact. I, I'm sure you might hear about that. And then uh, Thursday night was the big night, Compassion Night. That's our homeless ministry night. And then Friday night, which I think that was kind of the big impact for everybody, right? And then Friday night we did Princess Night, which was uh, a ministry to, to women who are target, and, and even men, because they're part of it as well, um, that are captured in this commercial uh, sexual exploitation um, gamut industry, yeah. And then Saturday, we, uh, Saturday morning, we did Adopt a Block. We went and uh, just spent some time in a community with some children and some adults. And then Saturday was uh, a free day. Saturday afternoon was a free day, and we just kind of had some fun doing some things. We went to church on Sunday, and we came back. So I want to turn it over now to, to Pastor Daniel. We'll let him speak. All right. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. So, yeah, the Dream Center trip really for me began uh, about two years ago, uh, most of you probably don't know that this coming week marks the, the two-year anniversary of three things, very big things that happened in my personal life, or in my life. One was uh, on a Tuesday morning, uh, God told me it was time for me to leave Reality Church. At that time, I was the administrative pastor, had been with the church for seven or eight years at that point, <clears throat> and God whispered in my ear that it was time for me to go, and I didn't, I didn't believe him at first, but he confirmed later um, and then that night, I, I began my first class at Regent, and in that first class, I met Matt. I ended up sitting next to him um, there in the first class, and so all in one day, my whole world pretty much changed. Um, fast forward a year, so fast forward a year, and now I'm the lead pastor of <laughs> Reality Church after having left um, and came back. I'll tell you that story another time. Um, and... Plus a year or so, I had a breakfast with Matt, and he was talking to me about considering, sorry about that, coming to um, reality. And uh, it was kind of funny because he was kind of talking about some woes he was having where he was, and I was trying really hard not to just say, hey, come to my church, you know, <laughs> because, but it, I was secretly hoping that he would. And then he did, and then a few months later, he's telling me about this Dream Center place, and I think it's cool, and I'm like, yeah, if you want to run it, go for it, and um, and so then he really picked it up, and he came on board, and he did it. And then, like he said, we started talking about it last November, and a whole lot of people were interested, which was really awesome. Uh, and then, you know, he figured out it was going to cost like $600 a person to go, and 
Uh, I was like, well, if God wants us to go, he'll provide the way for us. And sure enough, over the six months, we started fundraisers sometime in January. And over the six months prior to going to the Dream Center, we raised $12,000. 12, exactly what we needed for 20 people to go at $600 a pop. We raised $12,000 outside of the church budget. And at the same time, during those same six months, we gave away $12,000 as Matt was talking about, to these various other ministries around uh, the town. And to me, that was, again, just an awesome display of God at work. And so we went down to Atlanta. It was a great time. We got all these cool shirts, and and, they'll tell you some more stories. But to me, the biggest thing that was impacted upon me at that time was that all this stuff that had been happening over the past two years— from me leaving, to me coming back, to uh, the vision and the mission that God gave me for this church, and then and the people that have bought into it, and then Matt coming on, and then that whole change at the beginning of the summer, where it's like, I'm going to do parables, but now you're going to do prayer, and you've got to be a praying church right now. It just became so evident when I, be, when I went there that this is you know, God had planned this whole thing the whole time. And so while we were there, one of the things that really impressed upon me was how much prayer we did. We prayed all the time. And one of, well, actually, probably my favorite event is probably most people's least favorite event was when we went and cleaned uh, the Pine, St- uh, Pine Street shelter. It was the, one of the first things we did. It was Monday. It was Tuesday morning, uh, right after we did praise and worship, and we went a few blocks down the road uh, to this shelter. Now, this place was uh, disgusting, to say the least. Uh, we learned later it wasn't really a shelter; it was an overflow, and all it was was this huge empty warehouse that some millionaire had purchased and said, you're going to house homeless people here. And so the bare minimum accommodations are there. You're talking like the paint's all peeling off the walls. It's this huge, like, I don't even know what it used to be before. It's just this huge, like, warehouse with no water, no toilets, no showers, no nothing. And they have these, no, no air conditioning. And there's these, like, these giant fans. And in the upstairs, there's just this room packed full of bunks. And they're not even the nice wooden bunks you find at, like, most retreat places. They're these, like, metal, you know, just wide enough for a human being to fit on. They're all rusted out. The mattresses are no better than, you know, one of those really cheap pillows you get that just turns into, like, nothing after a while. That's pretty much what the mattresses was. And these, and these were places that people were going to sleep that night. And it was because it was better, in some sense, to sleeping on the street. And we actually learned later from a guy that we met that he'd rather sleep on the street than sleeping in there because they don't have rules in there. And so people get hurt and things like that. And so there's like hundreds of these bunks in there. And so we're washing them and, uh, you know, and that kind of... So me and Deschelle and uh, Darlene went downstairs where in the, in the downstairs they call the basement is just this big open room, probably about almost the size of this auditorium, No air conditioning, just concrete floors. There's like a fan somewhere, and there's just chairs all over the place. And imagine all of you guys are homeless people, and it was just packed out with all these people just sitting there waiting to be able to sleep there that night. They had nothing else that they could do in their life. They're just sitting there biding their time. And so we went around, and we we prayed with a few of them and told them about the Dream Center. Uh, But it was... And, the, and you can imagine the smell. Most of them, of course, couldn't bathe most of the time. And, and it was just a, like an awful, awful place. But then we went upstairs, and this was, again, the most impactful thing to me. Because I didn't know what to expect the whole time. Is that when we were done cleaning, they told us, now what we're going to do is we're going to go pray over the different beds. We're going to split up in groups of two, and you're just going to go around the room, and you're going to pray over the beds as you feel led to do. Now, it seems weird. You know, like, it would be like praying over one of the seats in the auditorium. But it was, as we went along, it just got real that, you know what? Somebody whose life sucks way more than mine, this is his only bed tonight. And who knows what world he's got going on, what kind of disasters brought him to where he's probably addicted to something. Who knows you know, the difference between how I could end up there and, and they ended up there. And so uh, I went around with Grace, actually, and we just kept praying over these, you know, the Lord, please help the person that's sleeping here tonight. And, and it just impressed upon me that, you know what, cleaning a mattress is one thing. You know, that helps them that one night. The next night they got to sleep there again. And we're not sure who cleans it. But you know what? What we did is we, we, we tapped into the God of the universe who knows the number of hairs on their heads. And we said, Lord, we know we can't help these people, but we know that you can and to me, it was just a powerful moment of just, no kidding, it's, it's the difference between, you know what, I'm going to go hand a sandwich to someone and they smile and it makes me feel good, 
And I'm not ever even going to ever meet the person that I prayed for just now, but God knows their name. God knows who they were before they were born, and he's got them, just like he's got me. And so it just impacted, and then the rest of the trip, we prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. We did prayer walks, all these kinds of things, and it just was such a testament to me of the power of prayer, because as Matt will share in a minute, one of the other things I saw there, as I've mentioned before, and I'll be done, is that I saw what we are becoming or what we're supposed to become as a church that's so focused on prayer, so focused on not, necess- not doing it ourselves, not planning all these things we're going to do out in the community and we're going to save all these people, but saying, Lord, you can save them. What would you have me to do to help? What would you have, how would you want to use me? And it's this whole beginning with God, you are amazing and awesome. You want me to step? I'll step. I illustrated it to some friends. I'll stand up for a second is that I see them down there, is what they do is they have their faces looking up at God, and they say, God, you're awesome, you're good, you're amazing, you're wonderful. I'm here to use if you need me for anything. If you want me to participate in your plan, I know you don't need me, but you can use me, I'm here. And then when God says step to the right, they don't look down and make a plan and figure out where they're going to step. They say, okay, God, I'll step to the right. Or I'll step to the left. They never look away. It's like when Peter was on the water. It's just like constantly looking at Jesus. I'll keep walking. It doesn't even matter if I'm standing on water or standing on something else. Lord, I'm coming to you. And that's how they've been able to do everything they've done down there. Pastor Dan explained to us how, you know, we don't even go. Sometimes we don't even have a plan of how we're going to like do this or sustain it. God just says step. And we're like, okay, God, we're expecting you to have ground in front of me. And they do it. And they've caused so many lives to change. And so I see What God showed me down there is that that is what we are becoming. That is what we've been practicing and what we're going to be. And so that, to me, is kind of the big picture of why we went down there. And Matt will share some of the specifics of where that's going to go. So Yes. I'm done. (laughs) All right, now we're going to turn it over to Jesse, my best bud, and uh, our high-energy young adult down there. So the night that impacted me most was Compassion Night, and this is when we went out to this big parking lot area in downtown, um, not the nice part, and we fed the homeless and were able to give them clothes and just talk to them. And so I was actually really nervous about this night because I've always been kind of scared to talk to homeless people and I, or and people impoverished in general, and I thought... I'd had experience with pin ministry and JCOC, stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, I've always been like, oh, here's some pancakes. Now go away. So God was really working on me that night. I thought, God, I like talking to people, but I don't know what to say to these people. I don't know how I'm going to impact them. I don't know how I'm going to relate to them. And this is when he really showed me and was going to use this night to fine-tune a spirit of boldness within me. He told me, hey, you don't need to know what to say. It's not you talking anyway. It's you being there, and like Daniel said, being available for me to use you. And then I'll do the rest. So why are you afraid? So I'm like, okay, God, let's do this. (laughs) So throughout the night, I got to talk to various people, and it was a lot easier than I was expecting. When you're intentional about stepping out of your comfort zone, you'd be surprised how easy things come. So I got to talk to some people, and a lot of times, most of them do most of the talking anyway, so that helped out a lot. And it was really amazing to just look at them and see, hey, you're a real person. Like, you like sports, you like shopping, all these other things that I like, too. It's, you're not as different. The only thing different about you is your situation. So, um... I talked about it through the night, and the whole night, we had our haversacks of hope, which Matt will explain uh, later, but this one man caught my eye, and his name was Alvino. So I talked to him a little bit, and he was the only one honest enough to say, oh, how's your day going? He's like, eh, okay. So he caught my eye, and I lost him a little bit, talked to some other people, and I thought he was gone. I'm like, God, I wanted to give my backpack to this person. And so God showed me where he was. It's like, he's over there. So I went over there, just kind of sat down on the pavement. He was sitting down and started talking to him and say, hey, how's your day going? Is there anything I can pray for you? He's like, not really. I'm like, okay. Can I just pray for you in general? And he's like, Sure. That's one thing I found is you'd be amazed how receptive people are of just prayers, like specific or in general. Like we, 
society likes to make us think that no one wants God, that these people are against God, but they're really not. They're just waiting for you to ask and being bold enough to ask about it. So I prayed with him, and by this time, Daniel had come over and joined me. And at the end of my prayer, I told him, Alvino, I really believe God is telling me to give you my backpack. And where I was at a loss of words, Daniel was able to fill in and say, well, we don't really know what's in the backpack, but we know that there's a message in here that God specifically wants you to hear. And all the while that Daniel was telling him about the backpack, Alvino was looking straight into my eyes, something he hadn't done that whole time. And the look in his eyes, I will never forget. It was almost indescribable. It was a mix of disbelief and gratefulness. It was like a miracle to him that someone would care enough about him to think of that. It was so much more than me just meeting a physical need for him. It was the emotional the, that I cared about him like that, that I talked to him. And I thought to myself after, God, what if I wasn't bold enough to do that? What if I hadn't gone over and talked to him because I was scared? His life wouldn't be the same if it wasn't for that. And I don't know what that message in the bag was, but it's, I can guarantee it's still impacting him today. So this is when God showed me, imagine a church that is bold. Think about it. Imagine a church that is not afraid to step out of their comfort zone. Imagine a church that is so sold out to God that they don't care what people think about them, but they are willing to follow the Holy Spirit no matter where it leads. And I asked myself, what about this trip was so special that I wasn't scared to talk to these people? Nothing. Where you're sitting at today, in your workplace, in your family, there is nothing special about this mission trip. We just were pushed a little bit more. But the Holy Spirit is pushing all of us to step out, to be bold, and to make a difference in this world. The world belongs to those who are bold enough to make a change in it. So why are we afraid? And we think it's so complex and so, oh, I can't do that. It's as simple as asking, can I pray for you? Is there something you need help with? It's listening to them, to anyone. Be bold. Yeah. Wow. I want to follow that one. All right, next up is Tammy. If, if we had a most improved award, it would definitely go to Tammy. Um, you could just, you could see the change uh, from the day that she got there until the day that we left. You could, you could just see the renovation that God had done in her heart. So, Tammy, please share your experiences. Well, um, we had two nights that, or two one whole day, Thursday, that impacted me the most. It was the Kingdom Talk and um, Compassion Night. Uh, during the Kingdom, we learned that uh, we are basically standing in the way of God. We're on His throne, and the minute we step off of His throne, then we're putting our faith and our trust into God. And that is what I had to do because I'd always held back a part of me and didn't really allow God to take it because it thought it was just my guilt and I had to deal with it. But um, you don't. You just have to step out of the way and say, you've got this. It's all you, and I'm going to serve you. And he really put me to the test that night because um, as we were driving over for Compassion Night, Pastor Daniel asked me to go in the clothing truck, and I despise shopping, absolutely despise shopping. And I've been a chef forever because I don't really talk to people. But um, it was absolutely amazing. Darlene was there with me, and um, she also does not despise like to shop. So it was two people that cannot shop helping the homeless people shop for clothes. And it was an experience that I will always remember. They, um, they just want to know that they're loved and know that they're there, to, that you're there to listen to them and actually hear their stories. And they were absolutely amazing. I met a woman who had just given birth to a little girl and um, she was trying to get some clothes for her little girl and herself. And she was like soft-spoken, just very, very gentle. And I also met this man who was just barely getting back on his feet. He did have a job, but he was still staying at the shelter, and he was trying to um, get a place of his own, who ended up being the man that got the backpack that was sent with me. And he just was in awe that when I handed him the backpack, I told him I didn't have a clue what was in it, but I believe it was for him. And um, he just teared up and started crying. And that was an overwhelming experience, and he allowed me to pray for him and pray for um, his circumstances. 
And it just showed me that um, these people are no more broken than we are. They're just struggling a little harder. And uh, it just breaks your heart. God really will break your heart to build you up to what he needs you to be. It's all in the faith that you put into him that shows you that how devoted you are to him. And I believe that he sent us there to break us down, to build us up, and um, to bring us back here so that we can share these stories with you throughout the weeks and call us at home and ask us, hey, what did you do? And we're all human. We can all tell you what we did. Every experience was unique for just us. And it changed us in how we approach people, how we deal with situations. And um, I believe that we can actually go into our community and show them the love and care that we're there that God is running through us and it's going to flow through us to build up this community. Before, before we get to Darlene, I just want to interject uh, about the clothing closet. You've probably seen the picture up there by now. I don't know if you have, but it's something new at the Dream Center. Uh, it's, it's only been around a few short months, but they, they have a truck that they renovated and they have these clothes in it. And, uh, one side is women, one side is men's, and, and we, we take the, the homeless people through there and they're allowed to pick one item from each compartment. And normally, normally the staff, they take it out every Thursday night at Compassion Night, and normally the staff runs that truck. But uh, Mark, the, the, the director of missions down there, was so impressed with our team that uh, he approached me and asked me and Daniel if we would run the truck, that they trusted us to run this truck. And then here we end up putting, and we didn't know this, uh, we end up putting Darlene and Tammy in there who hate the shop. Who would have thought, right? And uh, it turns I begin to realize, like Jesse said, that people really do want people to come and approach them and just talk to them and maybe pray for them, maybe not. Um, one of my coolest stories, stories since I've come back is I pray to God, you know, when I come back from this mission trip is I want to be aware of people. I don't want to come back from this trip and not let it really change me. Um, so, is it yesterday that it I called? Friday. Friday. Okay, Friday. Um, just bear with this story. I'm going to tell you really quick. Friday, my nine-year-old Aaron wanted something from Walmart. Really didn't feel like going to Walmart on Battlefield. So, I pack him in the car, and we go to Walmart, and we pull up to the intersection, and the firemen were at the intersection doing fill the boot. Didn't have any cash on me, but we grab all the change in our car and we roll down the windows and I'm like, oh, this is a good opportunity. I'm going to fill in the boot and the lights turn green. I'm like, God bless you. What's your name? I'm going to pray for you. So, so it's like, oh, that's really cool. So anyway, we go on into Walmart and get what we need. So we're pulling out of Walmart and I see a homeless man under a shaded tree. So I'm starting to pull away and I'm thinking, oh, I don't have any change or any money or nothing to get him, to give him. Clearly as day, the Holy Spirit convicted me. I could hear him clearly as day. He said to me, you don't need to give him anything. You need to get out of the car and go talk to him and pray with him. So I turned around to Aaron and I said, Aaron, we're turning the car around and we're going to get out of the car and we're going to go over here and we're going to go talk to this man. He was like, okay, mom. Mm -hmm. So we turned the car around, we got out. And we get over, and the guy gets up, and I said, just start to talk to him. I said, hey, I said, I just saw you sitting here. I just wanted to come over and, and see how you're doing. I introduced myself, and he said, hi, my name is H.D. And I said, well, where are you from, H.D.? And he said, I'm from Athens, Georgia. And I said, you are? I said, H.D., I just went to Atlanta, Georgia a couple weeks ago. And he said, you did? And I said, yeah. I said, I went down there on a mission trip from my church to the Atlanta Dream Center. And he said, the Atlanta Dream Center? And I said, yeah. He said, wow. He said, have you ever heard of Compassion Night? <laughs> You're talking about Jesus bumps. I was trying to hold it together. I was like, 
I have heard of Compassionite. And he said, I have to be honest with you, he said, they have fed me and clothed me a many a times at Compassion Night in Atlanta with the Atlanta Dream Center. And so I'm kind of sitting there and I'm like, that is so awesome. I said, my church, we went down there and we spent a week with them. And I said, and we went to Compassion Night. And I said, in HD, I have to be honest with you, I ran that clothes closet and I don't like to shop. And he laughed. I said, my friend and I ran that clothes closet and I can shop in that clothes closet, but I cannot shop at home. And he laughed. And I said, but that is like such an awesome program. I said, we were down there for a week. And I said, it was such a blessing. And I said, I learned so much from it. And I said, and you know what? I wouldn't have stopped my truck today to talk to you if I wouldn't have gone down there and learned so much from Pastor Paul and their team. And he was like, they're just an awesome group. He said, I really, he said, I wouldn't have been fed or clothed. And he said, I'd, I've stayed in one of the homeless shelters down there. And he said, and so many people think that the homeless are on drugs and, and things like that. He said, but I've saved all the money that people have given me. And, and I got a bus ticket and I've come down here. And I have a cousin in Ocean View that's coming to pick me up. And, and I'm trying to make my, my way to Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, there's a job down there waiting for me. And, I, and he had some water and stuff. And I said, well, I don't have any money on me, but I have my husband's $10 Target gift card in my wallet. Can I give that to you? <laughs> and he was like, that would be a blessing. So I gave him Kelly's Target gift card. And um, I, said, <laughs> I said, would you mind um, if my son and I prayed with you? And he said, you just don't know how much that would be just a blessing to me. And I mean, I just am like, this is what it's about. This is what it's about. And so Aaron, who used to be so afraid, and in my head I'm thinking this is just such a blessing for Aaron to be able to see. And so here we are in the Battlefield Mart <laughs> parking lot, and he reached out and took our hands. And we stood there and prayed for him, for his safety and for his health and for him to make his way. And then we continued to talk, and he just thanked me for going down there and serving at Compassion Night and talked about how, you know, people going down there and helping them helped people like him. And to me, it was just such a God thing for me to be in Chesapeake and for somebody to have made it from Atlanta that had been a part of Compassion Night and for me to run into them and for God to say, okay, you've asked for discernment. You know, you've been down there, you, you've asked for all this. Well, here we go. Let's do this. And so there's so many, you know, different things that we've learned, but it's just so humbling, and that's what I want. I want, whether it is somebody homeless or whether it's if I'm in a store and I just walk up to somebody and say, hey, you know, can I just pray for you? It doesn't matter who they are. I am just excited that. God is showing me just to be bold, and it's okay. They might say no, not to pray, um, but I'm just so thankful that I was given this opportunity to, to go on this trip, and I would just encourage you to not be afraid because you never know who might need prayer. You might need prayer. They also taught us down there that, you know, to not get discouraged. Sometimes we want to just go out and just save everybody. We want everybody to know Jesus right away. And um, you're just, we're planting seeds. We're planting seeds. And so if enough people are kind and enough people are out there praying, then eventually that person is going to meet the right one that's going to be able to share Jesus with them. Um, so anyway, that's what I have. All right. Next up is Anna. Before I give Anna the mic, I just want to tell a quick story because for me, this was a simple but very impactful moment uh, for me in Atlanta. But it came on Tuesday, Tuesday morning uh, during the God Is. Uh, God Is, we were standing on the street corner with the signs, and I was standing next to Anna, and we were, we were just talking. We were having a conversation between ourselves, and there was this woman in a vehicle that was three lanes over. And Ann and I were just having a conversation, and this woman is, like, studying us, and she's looking at us. And 
I mean, she was literally like studying our every move. And it was so natural. Anna just looks over at her. She says, God loves you. She didn't scream it. She didn't yell it. It was just a very simple, like, conversation. Like, it, like this woman was just part of our conversation. And it hit this woman so hard, um, all she could do was look away. And, and I, I could just tell right away that, that what Anna had told her um, really watered a seed in her heart. And uh, I told Anna that that was one of the most real encounters I've ever or at least I had encountered down there, uh, my third time down there, and it was, it just reminded me of just such a simple thing like that, just a simple, I mean, the simplest of things can have such a profound impact um, on somebody who's, who's searching for God. So, Anna, tell us about your experience. Well, first I'm going to say something that I was not going to share, but I'm going to share it anyways. Um, we met some another mission trip that came from Charlotte, North Carolina. And there were seven people that were there on the mission trip. So we made friends with them and we we're talking first or second day we we're there. And I met this lady, her name is Cindy. And I'm looking at her and I go, well, how many of you are here? She goes, seven. I'm like, that's awesome. How big is your church? She goes, three, about 3,000. I'm like, okay. So she looks at me and she goes, how many of you are here? I say, 20. How big is your church? about a hundred. It was so <laughs> worth seeing her jaw just drop. She said, 20% of your church is here. <laughs> I said, sure enough, we are. And um, it's just a shout out, not just to those people that went, but thank you so much for each and every one of you that have supported us. Each one of you had a role to play. It's not just the people whose bodies went there to Atlanta, but it's everybody who has supported us and have put your love and money and time and so I was being able to make it uh, the trip down there. So thank you guys. But um, the most impactful um, night for me was, the most impactful experience was Princess Night. And Princess Night is when um, women with two men for protection, we got in a van and Daniel and Matt were with us and we just basically got in the worst part of Atlanta where women basically stand on the corners, sex trafficking. And Atlanta Dream Center has been doing this for years, and they have a program where they put a woman in the program that's about three years long. They help them to go through whatever doctors they need. They help them find job. They give them job training. So they basically put them in a safe house, so they support them. And sometimes it, it's been known where women just jump in a van and drive away and start their new life right then and there. So that's amazing. They have saved something like over... 100 women last year alone yeah. it's and really? 300 total it's 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 amazing how many lives have been changed through that so for us we got in a van and we're driving around and like i said it is probably the worst part of atlanta there is there is um just it's not a neighborhood you would go in by yourself for sure and you would not get out of the car even if you run out of gas you would just call somebody to come and get you but um we're driving and we're praying the entire time. We're praying for the women and men that we were passing and praying for God to just guide us and help us um, to find the people that we need to talk to. So we would get out of the car and if we see a woman, we would come over and we would give her a rose and a card and just ask her if, we would like to pray, if she would like for us to pray for her. And um, we did that throughout the whole night. And the first lady was stopped by. She was outside of the strip club. And she was taking us a smoke break, and we asked her if, we would, if she would like for us to pray for her, and she said that, yes, she's, um, she's applied for a job interview last week, and she's waiting to hear back. So we, you know, we prayed for her, so hopefully things go well for her. But the one that really made the most impact for me is the last stop that we've made. It was um, in a parking lot of convenience store, and we saw this girl just standing in the parking lot, early 20s, and um, we got out, our team, they broke us in teams, and they say, row one, get out, row two, get out, so I happened to be in the row that got out to talk to her, and we did our thing, we gave her the rose and the card, and we talked with her, and we asked her if she would like for us to pray, she asked to pray for safety, and we got back in the van, and at that moment, um, I just felt like I have to go and talk to her. 
And um, I look at the lady who was sitting at the front, and she's from the Dream Center, and they're one of the organizers. And I looked at her and I said, I want to go talk to her. And I thought she's going to look back at me and say, are you crazy? But no, she listened to me and she let me get out. And um, as I was walking to that girl, I did not know what I was going to say. And um, I came over to her and I basically started talking and telling her about myself a little bit. And um, she just, you know, when I looked at her, she had this sadness in her that you just could see that she's in a very, very dark place. And I was telling her, I started telling her that, well, I cannot relate to what she's doing and why I do not know her darkness. I have been in a dark place myself. And I know what it's like to go to bed not wanting to wake up in the morning. And I know what it's like to wake up and not wanting to get out of bed. And I've told her that it doesn't matter how hard and dark of a place she's in right now, she's never alone. God loves her and he's always with her. And I said that I have pulled through and so can you. It doesn't matter how bad your circumstances are. And I say that the biggest miracle for me was the fact that he has healed me. There were times in my life when I felt like I will not, never be able to laugh again, never be able to smile again. And the biggest miracle is that God has healed me and made me whole again on the inside. And I'm happy and joyful again. And I've told her that she can find that too. And I was, I was telling her about my own experience and telling her how much God really loves her, how special she is to him. I saw something resonate with her. I saw something touch her heart. I just saw it in her face. And um, we basically wrapped up. I got back in the van. And... Um, as I was sitting in the van, the first thought I had was from when Matt had his talk nine months ago. He said that he's planning on going to the Dream Center and you can sign up now or say that you might be interested. And um, I didn't know at the time all the details and whatnot. I did know it's gonna cost $600. And what happened the month before that is I lost my job. I was working for the company for seven years and. They just went out of a business, so I was unemployed, and my husband was supporting both of us, and I didn't know how I was going to come over to him and say, I, I'm sorry, honey, I know you're struggling to support both of us, but um, I'm going to need $600 so I can go to Atlanta to take care of some homeless people. <laughs> but uh, God has provided, and he made it possible, and um, I felt like that's why I was supposed to go, was because I was supposed to talk to that young girl and tell her that God loves her, basically. That, that was my whole sole purpose. And um, the feeling I had in the van that day, the, the easiest way to describe it is, I don't know, when you go shopping, you might not be as lazy as I, as I am, but when I pull up in my parking lot and I have 12 bags of groceries, and I do not want to go back and forth to the car 500 times, so I'm going to grab everything I have. I'm going to have six bags in one hand, six more in another hand. I'm going to stick a bottle of two liter soda in my teeth so I don't have to come back. <laughs> I'm going to open the door with my knee, bring it to the kitchen, drop it on the floor, and have, you know, that... that <sighs> I made it, you dropped that weight, and you just feel like, okay, you feel light again, and that's how I felt. I felt like I was scaring that weight inside of me, and I finally let it go, and I have poured what love I had into that girl, and that's what I was sent there to do. I really felt this, this notion that this, this is what this is, was all about. So a couple of days later, after we came back to Virginia Beach, Matt has mass texted everybody, and he said that Atlanta Dream Center has posted on their website that they have saved a girl of the street. Now, they do, not, they do not disclose the names. I do not know if that was my girl, but I have been waking up thinking about her and going to bed thinking about her. I have not stopped praying about her, and I really hope and pray that if it was not her, maybe one day it will be her. And that's what really, really impacted me. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, before I begin to wrap up here, I just, uh, you know, you said such a beautiful thing, Anna, that I think all of us, and we had 20 people that went. This is just a small representation of the people that went. I mean, we could sit up here for, for, for probably hours and, and tell stories. Um, 
But what I think is so cool is what you said, Anna, is that we all have that, that one person or a few people that really made an impact on us that we're still two weeks later praying for these people. We're still interceding, uh, you know, on their behalf. Uh, I mentioned, a couple of us mentioned the Haversacks of Hope. Uh, those were the backpacks that you all sponsored. Uh, we handed all those out. Each one of us took one, and, uh, and we handed them out. What I, what I can tell you about that is I was in on three of them personally, and I know, Jesse, you mentioned it. I think, Tammy, you mentioned it. It was so amazing to see the, the changing countenance of these people when we approached them, began talking to them. They were shy. They, they didn't really want to talk to us. They didn't want to uh, engage with us. And once we gave them these backpacks, it was almost like, it was like God opened a new door. You know, I, I gave away Missy's, Missy Marshall's backpack. Um, I gave it to this guy. His name was Moshe. And Moshe stood perpendicular to me. Wouldn't, he talked to me like this. He's like looking out the side of his eye. Never made eye contact with me. He, he engaged me in conversation, but he would not uh, turn towards me. And uh, so I said, well, Moshe, I, I would like to pray for you. What can I pray for you about? And, and he told me he wanted me to pray for knowledge and wisdom for him. So after I got done praying, I said to him, I said, uh, Moshe, I said, I, I don't know what's in this backpack. Uh, but I said, I feel like God wants me to give this to you, and I feel that this is an answer to your prayer about knowledge and wisdom. And for the first time, Moshe turned towards me. I mean, he looked into my eyes, I looked into his eyes, and there was just this connection um, that is indescribable. And uh, he reached out and gave me one of the biggest hugs I'd ever received in my life and thanked me for it. And I know of at least two other occasions that, that that same thing happened, and I'm sure, I know Roger has a great story. Um, what was, I think what was the best part about the whole backpacks is, is no one knew uh, whose backpack they had. I was the only person that knew uh, what backpack belonged to which person. I didn't read anyone's notes, but I knew what was in the backpack because I put it in the backpack. And as people began to tell me their stories and whatnot, it was so cool to me that I began to connect um, that story, the person in that story, their needs, and what was in this backpack. So I'm just here to tell you that if you sponsored one of those backpacks and I have that person's name, I will share that with you so that uh, you can pray for that person. But I promise you that you impacted that person's life. I, I guarantee it. What you wrote in that note is between you and the Holy Spirit and that person, but your backpack made a difference in that person's life. Um, so I will share that with you. So as we close up here, I'm sure everyone's probably thinking, so yeah, these are phenomenal stories. I was touched, um, but, but what's next? You know, how, how are we going to translate this to Virginia Beach? And the answer is, I don't know. I really don't know. As a missions pastor, I, I can't even tell you. Um, you know, are we going to Atlanta next year? I don't know. You know, are we going on an international missions trip next year? I don't know. You know, uh, but what I do know, what I do know is that God has placed a call on this church. I know that the leadership has acknowledged this call. I know that the missions team has acknowledged this call. And I know that we are going to, are trusting in God. We're believing in God. We're going to be obedient to God. And God is going to give us this next step. It's going to begin uh, not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. Uh, August 28th, we're going to go out in this school and we're going to do a prayer walk. And kind of like what Daniel said, I know it sounds awkward, but we're going to go to classrooms, we're going to go to lockers, and we're going to pray for the students that uh, those lockers represent. We're going to pray for the classrooms and the teachers and the students and the families that they represent, and we're just going to have God lead us, and we're going to pray over the school, um, over our church, over our community, and uh, and then we have another event that uh, we're looking to do. Uh, we're waiting for approval for that uh, in September. So more details to come on that. But I just wanted to share with you uh, something, a, a word from God. And, uh, you know, if you don't know, a call or a calling is a divine invitation, right, from God to either an individual or a corporate body to partner with him in, uh, in his mission, which is salvation, right? And that call, I'm, 
I promise you that call was on this church and it became so evident um, in this missions trip and the stories that we can share. I mean, Darlene's story, it's just amazing. Uh, the fact, you know, <laughs> Anna kept talking, it's going to cost me $600 to go on this trip. Actually, it cost her $0 to go on this trip because God paid for it all, right? So his hand has been in this um, all along. And it really took me back to Genesis 12, 1 through 4, uh, which was when God called Abraham, right? Abram at the time, he becomes Abram. I'm just going to refer to him as Abraham to alleviate any confusion. But the scripture says there in, 12, uh, in Genesis 12, verse 1, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, to a land that I will show you. And this was the calling of Abraham, right? He was called to, to leave his life, uh, the life that he lived, um, everything that he found comfort, the, just what he did, right? And, and God called him to go to this land that he would show him, that he had to abandon. Abraham had to abandon everything that he was ab about. And he had to trust, he had to embrace what God was telling him to do. Right? Sound familiar? And it, I mean, it had to be better. Come on, think about it. It had to have been better because if it wasn't, why would Abraham even have considered going, right? So Abraham had to give all that up because God knew in order for him to grow spiritually, he had to step outside of his comfort zone. I think every single person up here talked about stepping out of their comfort zone. You know, when we were in Atlanta, we were constantly stepping out of our comfort zone. Even though we had prayed for probably hundreds of people, um, each time it was, it was something different. And each time we had to step out of our comfort zone. And that's what we're being called right now. We're being called as a church to step outside of our comfort zone. We're being called to go into this community, to, to take the call of Abraham into this community. Right? So how does that happen? Well, God reveals it in his word, right? So it goes on to say in verse 2, he says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. All these statements are unconditional promises of God to Abraham. It had nothing to do with what Abraham was going to do, right? It had nothing to do with that, but it had everything to do with what God was going to do. And again, you heard in these stories, it, was, it wasn't us going up and praying for these people that made a difference in their life. It really wasn't. It was us going up, making ourselves available to pray for these people. We invited the Holy Spirit into the situation, and God came in, and he did wonders in our hearts. He did wonders in these people's hearts. And I mean, he changed. He changed the world that day, um, no doubt about it. But here's where the story gets good. It continues on, so that you will be a blessing, right? The so that, that's the explanation there, right? That's why uh, Abraham was called to leave this, this life of comfort into this, this promise of God and to embrace it because that's what it's all about. It's all about us partnering with God. Uh, God using us, God working in our heart to reach people that are lost, to reach people that, that have yet to respond to the call of God individually. Then he goes on to say, And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curse you I will curse. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Does that sound familiar? What does that sound like? It sounds like the gospel, right? Paul talks about that in Ephesians 3, right? Paul um, talks about how God had preached the gospel um, to Moses or uh, to Abraham early in the Old Testament. But here's the most important part of the story, and I think is perhaps maybe even the most important statement in the entire Bible. It says in verse 4, So Abram, Abraham went as the Lord had told him. Abraham responded to the call of God. Not only did he respond in faith, right, because he had to leave everything that he knew to embrace something that God was promising that, that he had no idea. I mean, think about that. You know, back in this day, 
And not only did he have faith, but that faith led him to respond obediently. And that's, you know, and, and I was thinking about this too. I'll just leave you with this. You know, there's, there's many callings um, in the Bible, right? We had Moses was called to be a lawgiver. You know, Joshua was called to be a great general. Um, you know, David was called to be a mighty king, and we had all these prophets that were, were called to be prophets. You know, those are all callings that God placed on their life, and, and you and I will probably never receive any kind of calling like that. Maybe, maybe not. But we can all, and we all have received um, the call of Abraham, and that's the call to respond to God uh, in faith, and to follow him obediently. So right now, where are we going? Well, like I said, right now the ball's in our court. You know, we, uh, we've been given this call. I think we have faith in the call uh, as leadership, um, as a church, and we're going to respond. We're going to respond obediently to God. Uh, we're going to follow his lead. And uh, we're going to say, yes, Lord, show us the next step. And uh, like Daniel said, even the Dream Center down there said sometimes they don't even plan this stuff. They just respond and we plan later. And we're prepared to do that too.